All right, folks, without further ado, I present you the EFF. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are here to talk today about searching and seizing your laptop. Uh, I saw that, uh, well, pretty Can much I, all of you. Hold, just don't hold around this part. Oh. If you hold that, that's worse. Yeah, that's, that should be good. Let's see. Is that any, is that any better? All right. So we're, we saw uh, almost all of you, if not all of you, have uh, laptops. Uh, and this is something in which you are, are, are a lot of personal information is stored inside that laptop. Uh, and it is something which you want to keep private. And so the question we're, we're asking today is, when can the government get access to that information? Uh, and we're going to start with first principles. Uh, here, here in the United States, we have the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment limits the ability of government uh, to search and seize evidence uh, without a warrant. And it protects against unreasonable searches and seizures. Uh, so there's a number, number of key words there. Uh, what is reasonable? What is a search? What is a seizure? Um, and so over the last uh, couple hundred years, courts have been looking at what the Fourth Amendment means and expanding upon the, these rules. Um, so starting out with some of the b basic definitions, uh, what is a search? A search occurs when you have an uh, uh, expectation of privacy, and that expectation is infringed. Uh, sorry, an expectation that society is prepared to consider reasonable, and that is infringed. And a seizure is when there is some meaningful interference with your possessory interests in the property. So a key phrase that has evolved over the years is the reasonable expectation of privacy. And this phrase comes up a lot in court cases. It occurs when you have an actual subjective expectation of privacy. You actually believe that it's private. But even if you actually honestly believe it's private, you also have to have an expectation that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable. And so this means that you can't just unreasonably believe that something is private and, and get the, the benefit of this, uh, uh, of this Fourth Amendment. So ordinarily, if you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, the government must obtain a warrant or fall within one of the exceptions to the warrant requirement. Um, the good news is that as a general matter and as a starting point, you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the contents of your laptop. So yay, you have to, uh, the government either has to get a warrant or fall within one of the uh, exceptions. And some of the reason for this is because the courts have recognized that a personal computer is a repository for private information the computer's owner does not intend to share with others. And for most people, I'm quoting from a court case here, uh, for most people, their computers are their most private spaces. And that was recognized by uh, a court out of the Tenth Circuit in United States versus Andres. And this is a case in which EFF filed a uh, amicus brief, a friend of the court brief, to help convince them to do the right thing. So you start out in this good place, uh, but then the question is, when will you lose that? Um, there are a couple ways that you can uh, lose it just uh, to begin with. Um, you can lose it if you are sharing it. So if there is a shared drive on your computer and you're sharing it with others, courts might find that to mean that you have put that outside of the scope of your reasonable expectation of privacy. If you are sharing files over a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, courts might say that, that those files are outside of the scope of where you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and then you can give consent. Uh, so even if you start out with a reasonable expectation of privacy, if the government comes along and says, hey, can we search your laptop? And then you say yes, well, then the Fourth Amendment isn't going to protect you much uh, after that point. However, consent can be revoked at any time prior to the search being completed. So if you're feeling some pressure, you uh, ended up saying, yes, you can search my laptop, and then have a few moments to think about it and decide really that it wasn't a good idea, you can revoke it until the, the search is completed. In those few moments, they remember what we had to say up here. <laughs> That's right. Think back to this. Think, oh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have consented to that. And you probably shouldn't consent to it. Um, <laughs> if there are multiple users of a computer, as a general matter, any one of them 
could consent. So if you, if you have a, a computer that is shared with others, if others have access privileges to it, uh, then uh, you have to trust everybody with access privileges to uh, not give consent uh, in inappropriate circumstances. Uh, however, courts have recognized that that consent is not for everything in the computer if you've taken measures to show that you're still expecting privacy. So if your files are encrypted, uh, password protected, such that someone has access to your computers but not access to all of the files on the computers, their consent only goes so far as they're authorized to access. So this is a good reason to uh, have uh, encrypted files on your computers and make sure you're not giving those passwords to, uh, to other people. Uh, a couple other consent circumstances, if you are a minor, if you're uh, under 18, parents can consent on your behalf. Uh, generally spouses can consent uh, for each other. But again, uh, if you have a password protection or other uh, uh, encryption that will keep the spouse from being able to access the files, the spouse can only consent to the extent that they have the access. Um, and sometimes consent can be uh, uh, implicit, so uh, uh, you know, be careful as to, as to what you are saying, and probably it's best if there's a circumstance in which consent may be coming up and you want to be maximum protection of your rights, uh, you want to be clear that you are not consenting. Um, so for example, in a case where someone invited an officer to take a look at the computer, uh, you know, it, it might have been argued that the consent was simply to perhaps open it up and take a brief look around, but when the officer continued to look deeper and start opening files and examining them and the defendant failed to object to the more thorough search, the court found that the consent uh, had, had expanded to that. And another case uh, was a case involving uh, consent to search a car. Um, and uh, the court said, okay, well, you uh, gave consent to search the car, and so that included the, uh, the memory of the seller phone that was in the car. Um, now, what we're talking about so far is government searches. Now, there's another category of searches, private searches, and the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect you against private activities, you know, unless the private person is acting as an agent of the government. Uh, and Jennifer's gonna talk more about private searches. But let me briefly go through some of the exceptions to the warrant requirement. Um, so if a search is not going to be found to be unconstitutional, even though it doesn't have a warrant, if it falls into one of the various exceptions. One is exigent circumstances. This means that there is a, in a sort of a, an emergency uh, where the, the evidence is in imminent danger of being destroyed, um, the, the, there's a threat to the police, uh, when the police are in hot pursuit of a suspect, uh, the suspect is likely to f uh, flee before the officer can search, uh, do a search warrant. Uh, courts have found that these emergency circumstances can allow for a, uh, a warrantless search. But in general, dealing with laptops, this is enough to support the warrantless seizure. They can grab the laptop, but then they properly should hold on to it until they can secure a warrant later, if they can secure a warrant later, uh, and, and not do a, a search until they've gone through the process of getting that warrant. Uh, one of the arguments that has come up in a laptop context with this is the government has argued that uh, the, the possibility that the battery might die uh, requires them to, to search uh, the computer uh, quickly because uh, who knows what might be lost if the battery dies, uh, as opposed to, I suppose, like finding a plug. Um, the next category uh, of exceptions to the search requirement is search incident to arrest. Um, and you know, this, this is generally a category for uh, when uh, the, uh, you know, they're taking somebody into custody, they're looking for like weapons or, or things like that on their person, um, something that can be used to affect their escape, like their uh, uh, lock picking set, um, or if there's a, a need to prevent the, the loss or, or um, destruction of evidence. Um, and so uh, this, uh, can be a fairly limited uh, exception. 
Uh, so for example, there was a case in which uh, the, uh, the officers uh, grabbed a footlocker and uh, they, they searched it 90 minutes after the arrest. And of course, that was not a search uh, incident to the arrest. You know, it has to have a certain amount of immediacy to it. And so it doesn't give the police free reign to search uh, anything uh, for investigatory purposes it has to be uh, limited. Uh, so there was a recent case, which is uh, about cell phones, so somewhat analogous to searching laptops, um, where the, the Northern District of California Federal Court uh, said that the exception should be address the need of law enforcers to seize weapons or other things that might be used to assault an officer, uh, affect an escape, as well as the need to prevent the loss or destruction of evidence, uh, and therefore they found that cell phones were, were protected by the Fourth Amendment because um, they didn't fall within that category and the court also uh, importantly noted uh, you know, good policy reason before, behind this is that uh, cell phones can store highly personal information, uh, can record the most private thoughts and conversations through email, through text, through voice and instant messages. And of course all these things also apply even more so to laptops. Um, a couple other categories, plain view. Uh, this is if uh, the, uh, the government is looking for one thing but then sees another thing while, while they're in the, in the course of looking at it. Um, and Jennifer will talk a little bit more about the plain view exception. Uh, there is a border search exception. So your rights are different when you're crossing a border. Uh, and Marsha will discuss that in more uh, detail. Uh, and then uh, in addition to your Fourth Amendment rights, there are also some statutes that uh, can uh, protect uh, your, your information, and Kevin will talk a little bit about more about those. So with that, I will turn it over to Jennifer. Is this one, Mark? Okay. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Kurt. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some examples, cases that EFF's been involved in or that I was involved in before I came to EFF. There are some examples of computer searches, and just hope that these illustrate a little bit some of the difficult questions. So one of the things um, you know, we're talking about with, in terms of consent or expectation of privacy has to do with com when computers are shared. So I think for most of us, we have our laptops. We may be the only person who uses our laptop. Um, but if you have a home computer, you might share it with your roommates or your spouse or, or somebody like that and have different accounts on the machine. How many people here have a situation like that? They have some computer that they have shared accounts on with other people. Okay, so you guys are probably thinking to yourselves, who can I really trust? You know, can I trust these, uh, these people I have shared accounts with not to crumble when the cops come to the door and want to search my computer? And, and what is the effect of having different accounts on the machine? Um, because password protection is complicated, right? Something could be password, you might need a password to access it because it's encrypted, or you might just need a password to access it because the machine's set up to have different accounts. And this was the issue that we dealt with in the Andrus case. Um, in this case, the uh, uh, police came by and got consent from the aged father of the defendant to search and seize the computer that was at that house. And Mr. Andrus had had an account on the machine um, that he had to log into when he was surfing his child pornography. Um, the father was not actually authorized to use the machine. He didn't know how to use a computer or anything like that, but the police took it and they searched it anyway. And um, you guys may or may not know this, but the forensic software that the FBI uses to do computer searches, NCASE, doesn't actually respond the um, divisions of, of password protected accounts um, or accounts on the machine in the same way that the user might approach it if you were just to go to the machine and type on the keyboard and see that it you know has a list of people who are there to be allowed to use it. So um, the question was, was the consent of the father adequate enough to give police access to the rest of the machine so that they could get a hold of the evidence that they had about, against Mr. Andrus based on the consent exception and not on the Fourth Amendment um, and, not by, and without having gotten a warrant? Um, and, and, you know, there I think for the court there was a real issue about what the officers knew or should have known at the time that they took the machine from the father and what was right there. So the, the thing there technologically that I think is the lesson to learn is that even if you have, if you have accounts, separate accounts, that may help you show that you have an expectation of privacy. Kurt and I share a computer. He doesn't have access to my stuff. I don't have access to his stuff. I still have an expectation of privacy. I haven't shared it. What if we share it a little bit? Um, if we share it a little bit, 
I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but, but then the question is even technologically, if the police come in and they seize the machine because they have probable cause to uh, search stuff about Kurt or because Kurt gives them a consent, what does that mean for me? And I think one of the real problems we see is that technologically the forensic software hasn't been configured to respect that you know, kind of reasonable conception that people normally have about what it means to have different accounts on the computer. Um, technological protections are often some of your best ways to assure privacy where the law kind of fails and this issue is still being really kind of litigated and hashed out in the courts. It's not, it's also kind of a more subtle question as to what happens if you share a little tiny bit. And this was a case that I was involved in before EFF, United States versus Heckenkamp, where Mr. Heckenkamp had his computer attached to a school network um, at just in the dorm room. And the school network had an acceptable use policy that said, well, you know, we, the school administrators, can look at your machine a little bit if we want to, to ensure the health of the network, um, but not necessarily for other reasons. And this is a real issue we litigate against the government all the time, which is what is the effect on the reasonable expectation of privacy and therefore whether the Fourth Amendment has any role to play whatsoever when you've given somebody access for a little tiny, for, for some reasons but not for all reasons. And the government always or usually argues that um, it's an all or nothing kind of thing. Like, you know, I always say it's like inviting a vampire into your house. Like if you don't invite them in, they can't come in at all. But if you say, oh, come in, but just for a cup of coffee, they can run amok and do whatever they want. And that's the government's view. Like once you let us in, we can run amok and we can do whatever we want. Once you let somebody else in, you don't have an expectation of privacy because you gave it up vis-a-vis -vis this other person. So you don't have it vis-a-vis -vis the government either. And the Heckenkamp Court in the Ninth Circuit rejected that. And I think went along with what I think is the predominant view and I think is the correct view, which is that, um, Privacy is subtle, and we may share with people for certain limited purposes, but limited sharing doesn't mean that we've given up all of our expectation of privacy with regards to the entire world, and the Fourth Amendment has no role to play. Mr. Heckenkamp wasn't actually able, that was the good part of the Heckenkamp case, Mr. Heckenkamp wasn't really able to benefit fully from that aspect of it because he was um, at a university. And this brings me to the other kind of complicated issue that Kurt touched upon, which is the issue of private search um, and public search. Thing number one is that the Fourth Amendment applies to regulate the behavior of uh, the government, including state governments and local governments. It doesn't regulate private behavior. Okay, so that's a totally separate category. Private searches, if governed by anything, are governed by totally different stuff. But sometimes you have employers or schools or those sorts of things that are public, like the University of Wisconsin or University of California or um, the police department or something like that, where it is both public and is serving this um, kind of private or sort of school or employer role and what happens there. Um, and in those cases, the Fourth Amendment does apply, kind of a modified, sort of slightly watered down version of the Fourth Amendment, but the Fourth Amendment does apply. And the basically functions to say, police invest type of investigations, wrongdoing investigations, are still governed by the Fourth Amendment, but employer or school type of searches, um, which are for the purpose of that um, service, those are not governed by the Fourth Amendment. Um, and in, Hecken, in the Heckenkamp case, what the court said was, his, the, cert, the fact that the search was conducted without a warrant of his machine as it was con connected to the school network um, is excused because the university was doing it because they were concerned about the security of their system. They weren't doing it just to investigate him to see who had committed this crime. Of course, who was compromising the security of the system was the same question as who was committing this crime, but the court found under the testimony that was offered um, that the school's motive was this um, safeguarding one as opposed to a investigatory one and allowed the search to stand. Um, this was also an issue in a Supreme Court case that EFF was involved in uh, this last Supreme Court term, which is City of Ontario versus Kwan, where uh, Mr. Kwan was a police officer using his police department issued text messaging pager to exchange dirty text messages with his wife and his lover and another guy. I don't know what that was about. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, one of the issues there, one of the big issues there was the question of, you know, he's a, he was the police department is both the police department, but it's also his employer. And what rules applied there? Was it sort of the pure Fourth Amendment um, type of rules or was it as 
the court found in Quan, one of these kind of watered down things because it was, they were serving this other role, not purely investigatory, it was about the role, uh, it was about the police department as employer as opposed to the police department being investigators. So you can see, I think, with these examples of machines being connected to networks, acceptable use policies, um, shared accounts, and just the vast amount of intermingled evidence, how, how complicated um, the uh, how complicated it is to decide how to apply the old rules um, about searches and seizures to computers. And one of the uh, ways we've tried to address this, or courts have tried to address this, is through um, trying to set up some kind of things that police can follow so that they understand what's going on. And the Ninth Circuit has really taken a giant um, leap in this in the case of United States versus comprehensive drug testing. Probably one of the most important computer search cases uh, of the past five years. And in this case, the Ninth Circuit set out some rules for officers to follow that it hopes addresses this problem of, you know, once you're in the computer, it's just a free-for-all. You can get access to all the information that's there. So I'm going to just say what the rules of comprehensive drug testing are and then let Marsha talk about uh, border search. One is that the court recommends that investigators waive the plain view doctrine, um, which is an amazing recommendation. In other words, you know, if you're looking for something and you see something else, um, normally the cops can seize it if it seems to be evidence of crime, but under comprehensive drug testing they want police officers to waive that. Number two is that um, officers should have an alternative search team, either within the police department or independent third party forensic investigators who will filter through the information to get what it is that they have probable cause to search for and segregate and redact out everything else to retain the privacy of that information. For those of you who are thinking about third party forensic uh, businesses, it's a growth industry in the Ninth Circuit right now. Three is they should say what the actual risks of destruction are, not this battery might die or digital evidence is so delicate, who knows what could possibly happen to it if we don't search it right now without a warrant, um, but disclose the actual risks of any kind of destruction or interference with the evidence. Number four, they should have a search protocol that only goes to look for the stuff that they have probable cause for and not for other stuff. So for example, in a case that um, that uh, Marsha and Matt and I have, where they were looking for evidence of who sent email threats, they shouldn't also be searching through everybody's computers for arson or for uh, vandalism or other types of things on a fishing expedition. And finally, the idea that when, uh, the, after the search is done, when you have the stuff that you had probable cause for and you were allowed to search for and you've got all the other stuff, they've got to destroy or return the other stuff and can't hold on to it in order to like fish through it later on if they get bored or that sort of thing. Um, so Marsha's going to talk about the complexities of border search and then uh, Kevin's going to talk about what happens when you don't have your data stored on your device or phone or laptop but it's in the cloud and maybe if we have time then I'll come back and talk about Rayburg and the Fourth Amendment stuff or you can talk about it then. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. So I'm going to talk about an exception to the Fourth Amendment that applies at the borders. How many of you how many of you uh, take your laptops on international trips? And how many of you have information on those laptops that you consider confidential? Yep. So, I hate to tell you this, <laughs> but um, all searches that occur at the border are considered reasonable. So Kurt mentioned that the Fourth Amendment protects against unreasonable searches and, and seizures. And the rationale for this exception at the border is that the government has uh, an interest in, in keeping bad stuff, you know, illegal stuff out of the country. And so what that means is that for uh, routine searches, they need no suspicion whatsoever to, to search things that you bring into the country. Um, there is a very, very narrow uh, category of, uh, of search that's considered non-routine, but it's very narrow. I mean, it, it's like your elementary canal. That's what it is. They need reasonable suspicion to, to, to do a search like that. Um, in the past few years, there, there have been several cases that have come up where uh, the government has searched laptops and other digital devices um, that either are coming across the border from Canada or Mexico into the United States or um, at, at an airport, which is considered sort of the functional equivalent to the border when somebody is flying in from an international location. And um, the courts have uniformly found that despite the tremendous amount of information on a laptop, 
A search of a laptop is routine and therefore requires no suspicion whatsoever. So that is something that I think a lot of people probably don't know and that people should take into account when they're traveling with their laptops internationally. Um, there are a couple of interesting developments that are going on despite this really bad rule. Um, there's a case that's being litigated right now in the Ninth Circuit called United States versus Cotterman. Uh, the oral argument will be in September in San Francisco if anybody's interested. This is a case in which a man was driving with his wife from Mexico into the United States and um, the, uh, the border guards ended up seizing his computer and his wife's computer. They didn't have um, the, uh, the tools to do the sort of forensic analysis that they wanted to, so they took those computers 170 miles away to do the, to do the search and they kept them for four days. And um, the, the, the district court in that case found that uh, actually the, the government needed reasonable suspicion in that case to do that because they actually took the computers so far away for so long that the government lost its, its um, border search status. So this is a really interesting situation. Um, I think it, it creates some, some issues for the government because it basically means that if they uh, you know, w want to be able to, to search a computer on, on no suspicion, you know, they, they need to do it pretty much on site and very quickly, um, which may logistically be difficult and you know, may not really be feasible in all situations. But um, so this is a chink in the armor, at least. And you know, we'll see what happens in the Ninth Circuit. Um, there have been a couple other uh, district court decisions that have followed Cotterman at this point. So it's going to be interesting to see if that holds up. Um, another thing I wanted to mention that has come up in the border search context uh, that is not necessarily tied to the border, I think it could also come up in other contexts, but it just happens to have come up in the border search context, is the question of compelled disclosure of passwords. There was a case a couple years ago um, involving a, a man named uh, Sebastian Boucher who was coming from Canada into the country and um, his computer happened to be on. Um, agents were able to, to go through it and see some of the content. There was some that they found to be questionable. They suspected it might be child pornography. They shut down the computer and later when they tried to boot it up again, they realized that the, uh, the, the drive that the questionable content was on was encrypted. And they tried to force him to give them the password so that they could access that information. And um, the court in that case found that to force Mr. Boucher to give over his password uh, would violate his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Now the, the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination says that you cannot be forced to give testimonial evidence that would tend to incriminate you. And so they basically said that forcing Mr. Boucher to give his password would reveal the contents of his, of his mind, his knowledge as to uh, that password and that would tend to incriminate him and they weren't allowed to do that. So uh, that is also a very interesting precedent. That one stands. It was not appealed by the government. Um, there's been another case since then uh, in Michigan that, that followed a similar reasoning. So um, you know that's another kind of interesting and developing area of uh, border search related law as well. Um, so that's what I have for you and now Kevin's going to talk about uh, the statutory protections for email. Hey everyone, thanks for coming. Um, actually I'll start with a brief discussion of the Fourth Amendment um, when it comes to the data you store in the cloud uh, or with other third party providers. Forty years ago the Supreme Court found that you had a reasonable expectation of privacy in your phone calls. Despite the fact that the phone company had access to those calls, could listen in on them, that it was carried over this third party company's equipment, you had a reasonable expectation of privacy and the government had to get a warrant, actually something we colloquially call a super warrant, a wiretap order, if they wanted to listen in on your calls. We at EFF think that that logic clearly applies to your electronic communications as well, your emails, your IMs, et cetera, et cetera. The courts, unfortunately, have not quite caught up with our enlightened view uh, on the subject. Um, instead, the courts have tried to avoid answering the question 
of what Fourth Amendment protection you have in your electronic communications. This was most recently uh, demonstrated in the Kwan case that Jennifer mentioned, where the Supreme Court said, well, you know, this technology is so new and we're not quite sure of society's expectations regarding it, um, so we're just not going to decide whether you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in your pager text messages. Um, how old is that technology? I, it, it's older than I am, practically. But um, following Kwan's lead in a case that we were involved in in Georgia in the uh, Third Circuit, uh, Rayburg v. Hodges, this was a case of a whistleblower uh, about corruption in, uh, in the local government, and local authorities used a sham subpoena, an invalid subpoena, to get the content of his email. And uh, the appeals court, following Kwan, said, well, you know, this email technology, it's so new. Um, and we really don't want to make an unnecessary judgment on whether people have an expectation of privacy in their email. So with courts like this, it becomes all the more important what are your statutory protections? What protections has Congress given to you above and beyond the Fourth Amendment that protect your privacy? Uh, and Congress has passed a statute that, that does purport to uh, protect your communications privacy. It's called the ECPA, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986, eons ago in internet time, and that's, that's going to be a problem, uh, as I'll explain. Uh, and in particular, the Stored Communications Act portion of the ECPA. Um, which protects your stored communications and records about your communications activity. And it, it's not really that great. Uh, we appreciate the effort from Congress, but um, to very briefly summarize what it does, it creates rules, procedures, uh, that the government has to follow if it wants to get your communications or records about your communications from two different types of entities, remote computing services, and electronic communication services. Uh, and those are pretty much what they sound like. A remote computing service is a service that you store your data with or that you send your data to to be processed for you. So uh, online backup services, virtual storage lockers, that would be an RCS, while your email provider, your ISP, your IM provider, your phone company would all be ECSs. And what level of protection you get is turns on which type of entity we're talking about. Um, we'll start with RCS, which is in a really bad way. Um, to the extent you're storing your data in the cloud, uh, be it a you know, storage locker, online backup, whatever, which I expect people with laptops are more likely to do, you want to be able to access your data anywhere, it's dead easy for the government to get that data. Rather than having to get a search warrant under this statute, they can get only a uh, subpoena which essentially a prosecutor on their own can write out a subpoena and serve it, uh, or they have to get a much lesser, uh, uh, or they can get a court order that's much easier to get than a probable cause warrant. Instead, they just have to demonstrate that the information they're seeking is relevant to their criminal investigation. So basically, this isn't what they do when they have probable cause, this is how they get probable cause. Uh, this is before they have probable cause to know there's a crime being committed, uh, it's while they're trying to establish that. So it's very easy for the government to get the data that you store with a third party remote computing service. Um, and you don't get notified immediately. Uh, you're supposed to get notified, but there are very liberal rules for the government uh, to delay that notice based solely on a certification by a supervisory official that it would have an adverse effect on their investigation. And so they can get a 90-day delay of notice to you when they seize your files, um, which they can renew for as long as they think it would hurt their investigation. So very easy for the government to get that data. When it comes to your stored communications that are stored by your communications provider, the rules are much more protective, at least on their face. The government actually does have to get a warrant for the first 180 days. Um, you're probably wondering, why does the law only protect, my, say, my stored emails that I store with Gmail for only six months? Well, remember, this law was written in 1986. This was back when we would you know, dial into our BBS and pull down our email and delete it off the server. No one had enough server, you know, storage was so expensive, no one was going to store your emails for a very long time. And if they even happened to store it for longer than six months, if you hadn't accessed it for six months, 
you'd presumably abandoned it and any privacy interest you have. So this is just one way in which this law is really archaic. Uh, because there's this arbitrary cutoff at six months where you lose strong privacy protections and move to the RCS rules such that the government can get it with just a subpoena or an order based on, on relevance. <coughs> Excuse me. So that sounds okay. You know, at least they have to get a warrant for, you know, your more recent stuff. Um, so please do delete your stuff within 180 days if you can. Um, but actually, it's worse than that, because the government reads the statute in a really weird way. Uh, the statute protects communications that are in electronic storage, a defined term in the statute. And based on the uh, particulars of that definition, the government doesn't think that definition applies to emails after you've opened them, and also doesn't apply to emails in your sent folder or your draft emails. So basically, under the government's view, under the primary federal electronic privacy statute that's supposed to protect you and encourage you to use these wonderful new services, the only thing that requires a warrant are the few emails in your inbox right now that you haven't looked at yet. Um, this is a problem. Um, <laughs> suffice to say. And there is a great uh, opinion in the Ninth Circuit, which in includes uh, this fine state here, um, disagreeing with the government and saying that even open mails are in electronic storage. But DOJ still disagrees. Its regular practice outside of the Ninth Circuit is to only use subpoenas or these lesser court orders to get all of your open email and sent email and draft mail. And because of the Patriot Act, which allows for uh, a nationwide service of this kind of process, they'll often use these orders or subpoenas to go after stuff stored in the Ninth Circuit using a court outside of the Ninth Circuit, something we've seen a number of times. Most recently in a case in Colorado that we participated in as friends of the court where the government was trying to get this information, uh, get some opened emails from Yahoo. And Yahoo was able to get uh, their brief and the government's brief unsealed so that we could jump in and assist. Uh, and we got a great coalition of civil liberties groups and companies like Google to say, this reading of the law is boneheaded and this Ninth Circuit law contradicts it and you shouldn't do this. And the government was, well, okay, actually we don't need that anymore. We're just going to withdraw our application. So we couldn't get to the point where we actually got a decision saying, no, you can't do this. And this has actually happened to us a number of times where federal magistrates who've been asked by the government to authorize these non-warrant seizures of email, we would get invited by those judges to brief them and give them our perspective on this boneheaded uh, reading of the law. And twice now, three times counting this Yahoo case, as soon as we got involved, the government backed down. That's really flattering, but it, it doesn't move the ball at all. It actually keeps us from establishing the law in a good way. Um, so it's because of this ridiculous opened unopened distinction. It's because of this ridiculous and arbitrary 180 day cutoff. Uh, and for a variety of other clear, this area of law and the Stored Communications Act in particular needs to get updated by Congress for the 21st century because it just isn't working anymore. And so we've been working very hard on a project called the Digital Due Process Coalition uh, in cooperation with uh, the Center for Democracy and Technology and ACLU and a broad swath of companies like Google uh, and Microsoft and AT&T, an obvious enemy of ours in other contexts, where we've all gotten together and gone to Congress and say, it's time to update the rules. And in particular, on this issue, it should be clear that a warrant is required if the government wants your data whether it's from an electronic communication service provider or a remote computing service provider, whether you've opened it or not, whether it's in electronic storage or not. And there have been hearings on this and we hope to have a bill sometime next year because the uh, problem is just getting worse and the government is clearly not abandoning its, I'll say it once again, boneheaded reading of this area of the law. Um, so in the meantime, if you can avoid storing stuff with a third party, please do avoid it. Um, if you can pop your mail and delete stuff off the server as soon as you grab it so that you don't have opened email sitting on a server that the government thinks it can get without a warrant, you should do that. 
um, and uh, get, a, get a physical backup drive um, rather than using online backup if you can. Um, Kurt is going to say a little bit of something about one other statutory protection for your data, or rather for the data of journalists. Move up here for a second. So, oh yeah, I want to talk about one other statute, which is the Privacy Protection Act. Uh, this was a law passed uh, in the wake of a 1978 uh, Supreme Court decision, and that decision arose out of a situation in which uh, the Stanford Daily, a, a newspaper at Stanford University, was subjected to a newsroom search. Uh, so they had written some articles and the, uh, about uh, an incident that the police were very interested in investigating and they thought that uh, they might find some useful information by uh, searching the newsroom, went in there and they took all the stuff uh, and this upset a lot of people uh, because the court found that the First Amendment interests of journalists uh, nor, even, or, nor, nor, nor the Fourth Amendment interests of the journalists were sufficient to stop this search. And it created sort of the specter that the government could come in uh, and uh, raid a newsroom, not only looking for the, uh, the evidence that the journalists might have based on their sources and such, but taking the material that was going to be for publication and essentially affect a, uh, a restraint on future publications. So go seize all the, uh, the materials about to be published and shut down the newspaper. Um, so Congress, in, in sort of a, uh, a rare bit of uh, putting extra protections out there, uh, passed the Privacy Protection Act, which uh, makes it unlawful for the government to uh, go and raid, uh, raid a journalist uh, and sees the documentary material, material that is uh, is about to be published, or some of the excerpts from that material, even if that wasn't going to be published. And the the law is written to protect a person reasonably believed to have a purpose to disseminate to the public a newspaper, book, broadcast, or other similar form of public communication. So this is a law from from a long time ago, uh, where the uh, modes of communication and publication were a little bit more limited than they are today. Uh, now that the mode of uh, communication uh, includes a lot of different publications over the internet, this allows for a, a sort of a more expansive view of of what would be protected by the Privacy Protection Act. Uh, there is an, an important exception to this, which is when it is the, the journalist uh, themselves who are uh, suspected of committing the crime. Uh, but the exception to that exception, uh, stay, stay with me on this, There's exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions. And the exception to the exception is if the crime the journalist is suspected of uh, committing is the receipt of the information at issue or the, the publication of that issue. So they're trying to not create a sort of uh, a catch-22 uh, loophole where you can accuse someone of the crime of receiving the information uh, and then uh, get around this law. So in, in circumstances in which there is a, uh, a search of a, a computer which holds documentary materials like notes or uh, uh, articles that are being prepared for publication, uh, then definitely that is a, an additional issue that, that everyone should look into should that occur, uh, and the EFF would be a, a wonderful organization to contact that if that happens to you. Um, so I think that with that, that uh, wraps up uh, our uh, lecturing portion of today's program, uh, and we'd be happy to take uh, questions that you may have. Okay. It has the government expanded its definition of what constitutes the border for these purposes. And what I've seen is, is that I live in Michigan and it's only about 200 miles wide. So yeah. the state of Michigan basically The border search, ex so, so not to interrupt you, I just want to try to go. The border search exemption is about keeping the border safe as people cross the border, right? So if you live near the border, that's not where the exception applies. The exception is when you come in, and the question is how close to the border do they have to get you, and how long from the point that you enter do they have to um, be doing the search in order for that to be the thing that makes the border search exception apply. So that's, this issue is actually not relevant to the way that the courts define the border search exception, okay? That is a different thing that's court defined having to do with when the Fourth Amendment thing applies. Th this gentleman right here. I 
Mm -hmm. What about? Yeah. What about what about do you actually helping border search agents when or border agents when they're doing searches of your computers as you come in and what does that mean? So okay, the the issue of the Fifth Amendment is aside. It's about testimonial stuff and I think your question is, do I have to help them and explain to them I have separate accounts or that sort of thing? Um, no one can make you answer questions except for a judge. Um, you have to use your discretion to some extent about whether to answer or help and whether you think it will help you in the moment. Um, you know, usually we tell people don't consent, don't talk. There's always time for consenting and talking later after you've had a chance to talk to a lawyer and can, you know, make that a reasoned thing. Um, but there may be times where you're like, you think that that's different. Like, for example, they're going to search your laptop and it's got somebody else's account on it and you want to let them know so that they know they've got to steer clear of that information. Because even if they have something having to do with you, maybe they don't have probable cause or any excuse to look at that other stuff. And that's just like a judgment call. So if you're going to be doing, putting yourself in that kind of situation, you want advance advice, it's a good thing to to talk to lawyers a ahead of time. But um, anything you say can be used against you, so it has to be, you know, taken into consideration. This gentleman here in the white shirt. Um, I was wondering if there was a final resolution under the Warshak case and whether that had any impact on the Can you explain? Kevin's going to address Warshak. So, yes, uh, Stephen Warshak indicted for a variety of flavors of fraud related to the marketing of Ensite natural male enhancement. Uh, this case in the Sixth Circuit that involved um, them using these uh, lesser non-probable cause orders under the Stored Communications Act to obtain his email. Uh, Mr. Warshak believes, as we believe, that this is actually unconstitutional and the government should have to get a warrant. And we got a great decision from the uh, Sixth Circuit in Mr. Warshak's civil case against the government regarding his email seizures. Unfortunately, the Sixth Circuit, uh, finding that we were right, that the Fourth Amendment required a warrant and that to the extent the SCA didn't require a warrant, it was unconstitutional. Uh, but sort of embodying this trend of the courts kind of avoiding these issues, the Sixth Circuit en banc, the entire uh, panel of judges on the Sixth Circuit, when they reviewed it, said, no, we're vacating that decision. This issue isn't ripe anymore because they're, they're not getting his email anymore. Um, the issue has come back around now that Mr. Warshak has been convicted in his criminal case. And one of the, and one of the reasons on appeal why they think that conviction should be overturned is, again, the argument that, well, the emails that they used against him were seized in violation of the Fourth Amendment. So we have, uh, as we did in the civil case, participated as friends of the court on this criminal appeal, uh, and we're awaiting a decision there. And so uh, that is one of the avenues where we're hoping there's a possibility we will get a, a good ruling on the Fourth Amendment and email protection, but we haven't gotten a decision yet. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, um, we're being informed that we're done, and I never go against the goons, so nor should you. So uh, if there's other questions on this topic, I see this gentleman over here, or, or other topics, then I encourage you to come to our panel tonight at 6. And yes? Go to the Q &A room. Oh, we go to the Q&A room now? Okay, we'll go to the question and answer room now, and then also you can come to our panel that's at 6 tonight. So thank you all for coming and for your attention, and I appreciate it.